So, in last year's assembly for Leavers, I spoke about tattoos. It was, I think, a pretty upbeat message. I spoke about living life with no regrets. And it felt like last summer, we were coming out of a downbeat few years. I genuinely can't remember whether we were in face masks in that Leavers assembly, but I don't think so. Things were starting to open up again. And there was a palpable sense of relief that we were through the worst of it all. This year though, I'll be honest, I don't really feel a sense of relief so much as a sense of foreboding. Things are pretty bleak in the world at the moment. There's a cost of living crisis. There's a major European war for the first time in 70 odd years. And there's a climate crisis, the scale of which is truly terrifying. It all feels a little grim and makes me want to ask the question, when will there be good news? It certainly feels like a tough time to be leaving school. Very unlike when I left for university back in 1999. That year that Prince sang about back on his 1982 album was a fun time. The music was great. There was a very popular government in power. The economy was in rude health and global warming wasn't much talked about. This year's leavers have very few of those things and certainly not the music. Now, I promise, I am not going to spend this assembly talking about what the world was like when I were young. I'm not that much of a narcissist. Instead, I wanted to talk about how this year's leavers might approach the challenges that are upon them and upon all of us. As most of you know, I'm a history teacher and I will always tend to look to history for interesting parallels with how we might deal with things today. History doesn't ever repeat itself, despite Marx saying that it does, though in his case he said the first time as a tragedy and the second as a farce. However, sometimes what has gone before can at least give us a lens through which we can look at our world today. I wanted then to look at 1922, 100 years ago, and what the world then might teach us about how we can handle the world now. A century ago, the world was recovering from a devastating pandemic. Spanish flu had killed about 50 million people worldwide, nearly 10 times as many as died from COVID. And it was a strange flu in that, unlike most such illnesses, it had a very high mortality rate among the young, unlike COVID, which has been far more dangerous for the elderly and the infirm. Spanish flu came on the back of a world war that had killed just over 20 million people. A major European war, which disrupted the whole of the continent and dragged in all the other major powers into the conflict and went on for years. This might seem eerily prescient. It's not the only similarity with today though. In 1922, after a series of scandals, a prime minister famed for his infidelities and a flexible relationship with the truth was forced out of office. The turbulence of these years up to 1922 significantly altered the way that people lived and worked and their attitudes towards each other and the state. One result of these events was that the generation gap was stretched, perhaps beyond breaking point. Many of you will have read F. Scott Fitzgerald's novel, The Great Gatsby. This tale, perhaps more than any other, symbolizes the new world order that came into being after the war to end all wars and the influenza epidemic. Whilst it was written in 1924 and published in 1925, it's set in 1922. It's often held up as one of the greatest novels ever written. Its central theme is the American dream. And the main character is a charismatic self-made millionaire, Jay Gatsby. He rises from nothing and nowhere to dominate the social landscape of Long Island. He's from a different generation than the one that dominated before the chaos. And the phrase that's been used to describe to this group is the lost generation. Lost, referring to the disoriented, wandering, directionless spirit that the survivors of war and plague felt. The fictional Gatsby and his extravagant parties have provided a template for the sort of hedonistic excess that many people continue to aspire to. Many of today's top Instagram influencers seek this sort of Gatsby-esque lifestyle. The rapper and celeb KSI 
talks about it in his song Champagne, in which he says, when the bottles start popping and the champagne pours, you feel like the man and the world's all yours. A song which I'm willing to bet not a single adult in this room has ever heard. <laughs> Things like Snapchat, TikTok, and Instagram with its influencers are a great example of the growing generational gap in our own time. Not dissimilar to that which existed back in 1922. The lost generation of the 1920s may well have a mirror in today's youth. You are an age group who suffered more than most during the pandemic. Your lives were curtailed. Your formative experiences as teenagers were made much harder to come by. You were locked up for months on end without the social interaction that young people both need and crave. Times that the older generation had already had were lost to you and you can't get those back. The disconnect then between the old and the young in 1922 might serve as a lesson for us today. The US magazine, The Atlantic, published an editorial back in October 1922 in which they claimed that the old and the young are natural enemies, suspicious of each other, critical, distrustful, unsympathetic and hostile, and that a different language is spoken in both cases. The ideals are not the same. The sense of humour, the sense of taste and the sense of values are totally dissimilar. Snapchat. TikTok, Insta. I wonder how many of the values that exist in that sphere, so alien to so many of the adults in this room, are cross-generational. Very few, I suspect. So is there anything from 1922 that might show us what we need to do to get through the fallout from war and plague? To link the torn apart generations together again? To help the world heal from the crazy past few years? Are there any lessons we can take from 1922? Well, yes, I think there are. Lessons on how your new lost generation might approach the coming decades to improve their lot and to take on the challenges that are facing us all. In January, 1922, a 13-year-old boy from Toronto called Leonard Thompson became the first person to be injected with insulin. He was in a diabetic coma when he was given this experimental treatment a treatment which is now used daily by type one diabetics the world over. Before then, diabetics had to control their food intake and were slowly starved, meaning they were often wheelchair bound invalids. The doctors who devised this treatment, McLeod and Banting, were awarded the Nobel Prize for Medicine the following year. And these two men took several risks, as did Leonard's family, and they all showed huge amounts of courage. They were curious enough to explore a radical treatment that no one had ever used before. And they were generous enough to share their discovery with the world and to allow insulin to be produced worldwide. Courage, generosity, curiosity. The people involved in this groundbreaking treatment exhibited all three of these values and they revolutionized medicine. In March, 1922, Mahatma Gandhi, the Indian independence and civil rights campaigner, was tried for sedition, for encouraging people to rebel against the state. Gandhi advocated civil disobedience and was famed for his principles of satyagraha, a non-violent resistance towards evil. The literal translation of this is force born out of truth and love. Gandhi encouraged the Indian people to boycott British products to resign from working for the British Empire's institutions and to boycott the British Empire's courts and administration in India. He was sentenced to six years in prison for his efforts. And yet the judge who sentenced him in that year said as he did so, you are a great patriot and a great leader. Eventually, Gandhi ended British rule in India. He showed a huge amount of courage as did the Indian people, to stand up to the overwhelming might of the British Empire. He showed a generosity of spirit, never advocating violence on anyone and focusing instead upon love. He showed remarkable curiosity and developed his thinking from being part of the empire's structure to becoming one of its fiercest critics. 
courage, generosity, curiosity. Gandhi showed all three, brought down an empire and revolutionized the world. In November 1922, the archaeologist Howard Carter was digging in Egypt. He'd been digging in Egypt for many years and found very little. In, 1920, in 1912, another archaeologist had declared that there was little point, saying the valley of the tombs is now exhausted. It was thought that there were no more things to find. Carter wrote about what happened when he opened a tomb he found in that year. He said, as my eyes grew accustomed to the light, details of the room within emerged slowly from the mist. Strange animals, statues and gold. Everywhere the glint of gold. For the moment, an eternity it must have seemed to the others standing by, I was struck dumb with amazement. And when Lord Carnarvon, who was his financial backer, unable to stand the suspense any longer, inquired anxiously, can you see anything? It was all I could do to get out the words. Yes, wonderful things. Carter had discovered the tomb of the Pharaoh Tutankhamun, the greatest archeological discovery ever. Carter and Carnarvon showed curiosity, a desire to discover a world that was lost. They showed vast amounts of courage, keeping going in the face of the prevailing mood that there was no point and nothing more to find. They showed generosity, with the overwhelming majority of their finds going to the Egyptian mu museum in Cairo and not being held for personal use or profit. Courage, generosity, curiosity, all three shown by those who discovered the tomb of the most famous pharaoh ever and who revolutionized our understanding of the ancient world. Courage, generosity, curiosity. These values were in evidence in 1922, and they are the three things that you will need in this year and the years ahead to get past the effects of COVID and everything else. You're going to need to show courage to keep going in the face of the obstacles that are all around you. You're going to need curiosity to try and discover new ways and new ideas to make our world survive and thrive in the face of the challenges that it faces. You will have to imagine ways of working and living that are beyond the perceptions of the older generations like mine, stuck in older ways of doing things. You're going to need generosity, a generosity that those older than you haven't always shown very much of. How you treat each other and how you treat those around you will need to be rooted in generosity because only by working together in a way that our society so often fail to, will you be able to find the answers to those big existential questions? It's certainly a challenge and it's not a small one. Those pesky older people have messed up the world and are now asking you to go out and fix it, please. However, I think it's a challenge you're up to and in your time at the school and in your lives so far, you've had to show courage generosity and curiosity in bucket loads. Stick with those values and you will make the world anew, like they did in 1922. Your challenge is not only to make it again, but to keep on making it and to keep on revolutionizing, to keep on building on the good work that you've already put in. You're gonna need some luck, but most of all, you're gonna need those values. Rely upon them, you won't go far wrong.